come here and visit with you guys on, and on this uh, 75th uh, anniversary that we have. In fact, when I came here as a freshman in 1953, College Station was only 15 years old. So I've been a part of this community and, the, and probably the best decision that I ever made was having the opportunity to come back and live after I got through with the Air Force with Herschel Burgess and, and Dick Hervey. But there's some other numbers that I want to share with you right now. 60 years ago, I went to summer school this month, 60 years ago, in Junction, Texas. You know, that was a summer school for guys who wanted to get cranked up, get a few grade points. And, and I had this fear of, you know, really busting some grades and, and then making the transition at A&M. So I wanted to get a little head start. The second time I go to Junction is with Coach Bryant. And I'll tell you that story a little later. But then there's a third time. I also went to geology camp in Junction. So I hold a record for having attended three sessions of summer school at, uh, well, summer school, one little outing camp, camp out at uh, Junction. So it was, you know, <laughs> as I look at, at Junction, you know, a lot of us just really wanted to forget about it. When it was, we went through it, it was over with, and, and, and I'm surprised today that there's so much attention to it. And, and I think it's really because of the coach. Coach Paul Bryant goes on to be a distinguished um, coach, six national championships, goes to Alabama for 25 seasons. He wins, he's, he's uh, wins six national championships, but also uh, never, never loses uh, many games. So he became one of the winningest coaches in America. That notoriety in itself really then initiated his book in 1975, which said, and he talked more about uh, A&M in that book than he did about Alabama. But the point that he made was he regretted the decisions that he made at Junction. And he apologized, in fact, in, in, in our 25 years later, he said, Dennis, will you organize a reunion? I want to come back to Junction. We said, okay, we'll do that. <coughs> so we all go out there, and, uh, and that's our 25th anniversary from Junction, but he made a very clear point about abusing us. I mean, it was, uh, it was far beyond what a lot of people even begin to realize, but but the fact that his success and everything that was associated with him kind of dramatized the story. Then, of course, Jim Dent's book uh, added a little fiction to it, and it got even more <laughs> enhanced than what the real facts were. But, um, uh, you know, but, and, and the movie was made out of it. So, you know, one thing goes to another. But I'll get to a little bit of that a little later. But the other thing I want to say also, this. This is 50 years that I've been married to my wife. And so I have another reason to be excited and talk about the number of years that I've been in Bryan College Station. The other part about it is I've lived in the same house for 46 years. Now, a quick little honeymoon story. Now, Kay is from, from Houston and, and you know she was used to the big city life and, and when I fell in love with her, I, I had to really court hard to get her to even think about coming to College Station. You know, there's only 5,000 people here, 6,000 there. Finally won, okay? But while I was in, and that was after I'd been at the Savings and Loan three years. And um, so I had purchased 14 acres of land out here on Southwest Parkway and Glade. Glade Street didn't even come down there to it. And I had it all mapped out. I was I had it all where, where I wanted to put the houses back there on the creek with the culture sack, and I wanted to be on two or three acres because I was born and raised on a ranch. I didn't, I didn't want too many close neighbors. Drive down there. I had to walk all the way down there. So walking back, I get her in the car, and we're driving back, and I said, Hey, what do you think? What do you think? I'm so excited. And she didn't say anything. I said, Drive a little further. She says, I said, What's wrong? Little kid comes out and she said, it's too far out in the country. 
First domestic fight. Okay. So <laughs> we end up managing for Dick Hervey then his apartment complex. So that's how uh, some of those years have come and gone. In, uh, and of course, uh, I've really enjoyed being in Bryan College Station, and particularly College Station, all these years. Uh, I know when, when I um, decided to come to A&M, uh, I really wanted to come to a &M. I was raised on a ranch. I loved a and I came down here for the 4-H club roundups. But it was a drought, and uh, we, we kind of lost a lot of our income, and a lot of things were happening. And so I uh, tried to get a scholarship. I came down here on two or three occasions and said, hey, guys, can I get a scholarship? Yeah, no, go away. After the third time, and a little influence from a couple of the exes at home, he finally said, okay, we'll give you a trial scholarship. I said, ooh, okay, I can make it. Well, little did I know that, you know, I'm gonna have to compete with all these big guys, and, and sure enough, you know, Coach Zaplex is the coach, and uh, we have about 66 football players show up, and, and he didn't think very much of me. In fact, he, I played two minutes my first game just to ruin my eligibility. That was the, that was the MO. So I sat on the bench all year. So we, we played Texas the last game, and I'd made up my mind. I said, he's not going to put me in, and I don't want to go through life saying that I never played in Memorial Stadium. So I watched the clock, and when the clock got down to seven minutes in the game, I run out there on the field. <laughs> I said, hey, hey. Coach sent me in. He looked at you, sure? I said, yeah, get your ass off here. <laughs> I play those fat last few minutes. Coach didn't take me out, but boy, did I get a chewing out after that. <laughs> Coach Zappalak really never forgave me, okay? So Coach Bryan comes in 1954, and you know, I don't know a whole lot about him. I just know that he's a, he's a tough kind of a guy, and, uh, but didn't pay a lot of attention to it. Well, I'm, I'm saying, okay. We run down, I run down there. First day of spring training to see what team I'm on, okay? I'm on the 11th team, <laughs> the last team. And I'm, of course, I said, well, I'll make it. Well, spring training, I thought that year was a lot tougher really than, than Junction in many respects. Uh, they, their whole approach to football had, had changed. Uh, football had changed for several reasons. One. It no longer was a platoon system. If you played in one quarter and, and came out, you couldn't go into the next quarter if you were hurt or whatever. And so the whole dynamics of football changed. And Coach Bryant said you had to play tough all the time. So what he was really looking for was guys that had the ability to be tough and stay in the game. He did his homework. What he, what he did was grade the whole team and he was one of the first coaches to grade the team individually. In other words, guard, center, tackle, and everybody. If you did, made the play good, you got a plus. If you didn't, you got a negative. And he didn't like to play anybody that made less than 66%. So that's how he really was gauging the players. And not only did he film the practices, I mean, in addition to the game, but the practices. So that was a brutal spring training and not everybody realized, um, you know, what his, what he really wanted. But, you know, spring training's over, and he'd run off about 30, 40 guys, and I said, well, maybe I have a chance. So I go trotting in his office, and I said, Coach, uh, I don't have a scholarship for the next year, and, um, and I sure want one of those summer jobs. And he looks up at me and says, Dennis, you're not a football player. We don't want you. I'm deflated. I mean, I just, I'm, I kind of get up out of my chair. I had a little bit of a temper in those days, and I jumped up and I said, got in his, over the desk like this and looked at him, because it's the last chance I had. <laughs> Let's make a deal. And he stands back, he said, what do you mean a deal? I said, let me come out this fall. If I make the team, you give me a scholarship. If I don't, you're out of here. He said, you got a deal. Boy, I'm so happy. And I got the last job 
that was offered. I wanted to get in a, in a, in an oil field, where that's where the pay was, but I got the job in a steel mill. There were two basketball players and one track guy and me. So I'm saying, okay, at least it's a job. And um, so we get down there, and um, after a few days, you know, they, they, they called us scabs anyway. The industrial labor guy comes up to us and says, hey, we got a problem. We have a wildcat strike in the blast furnace, and we want you all to help us break it up. And I said, what's the strike? I didn't, you know. So they explained it to us. So we go down in the blast furnace. These guys would come to work, say they're sick, and leave. They were just disrupting the whole operation of the blast furnace. And did they, ooh. I mean, those guys cussed me out. They cut up my clothes in the locker plant. I mean, uh, in our lockers. You know, we were so dirty when we came out. We had a shower and everything else. And they were abusive. And I said, oh, what? What am I getting myself in? I slept with a pistol in, under my bed. And because we were living on, on ship channel anyway. So long story short again, um, I worked every job in, in the blast furnace. And I asked the, the superintendent one day, I said, these guys are really making it tough on me. He said, uh, he said, Dennis, if they hit you, we can fire them. I said, all right. <laughs> they never would let me in their little locker room to eat with them. So I said, I walk in there that day and I said, all right, boys, I want to eat with y'all today. Y'all got any objection? They all look at me and I said, I said, particularly you, you're the one that's giving me the most trouble. Everybody got quiet. I settled the fight because they started letting me eat there then. But it was, it was really a gut check. So I'm in all, in all the heat and everything. The blast furnace is 120 degrees. We wore asbestos suits and everything else. And um, anyway, I'm saying, well, I'm gonna be in shape. So we get back here. And of course, one of the things that, that Coach Ryan did make a change, and we changed to Alton Hall. We didn't have to march to Chow anymore. And we had our own um, uh, dining hall. So we get there, there are two buses out there and they said, pack your bags, we're going to Junction. Nobody knew where Junction was but me. And I said, I told the guy, I said, hey, listen, this is, this is gonna be out. He goes, it's nice and green out there. <laughs> I have been out to there and, you know, and we got irrigation, we got huts, it's, it's cooler. We don't, see, we didn't have air conditioning or anything here. Then. So <laughs> one of the things that happened, we get out there, and everybody says, wait a minute, what is this? So, summer school had been over about 30 days. No irrigation was on. Fields were all dry. Cockerburrs and grass burrs grew up. And that was it. Even the coaches were surprised. So, the first two days, I, I can't even remember. They were, they were brutal. Absolutely brutal. And, um, you know, we got up at sundup, had a glass of orange juice, then two-hour workouts, then we had classroom. He really was good at lecturing, new techniques, how, to, how, to, how the system had changed and what we had to adjust to. Then we had lunch and then the classroom again, four o'clock practice, and then go to bed. No water. In those days, we had no water to drink. That was, that was it. All the coaches were that way. So that was not a good deal. And it was, plus it was abusive, and I won't go into all those details except to say to you that there were, you practice till you flop or you got hurt. And, and the other part about that is that the players weren't used to that kind of treatment. And, and they were, you know, like Coach George, they weren't that aggressive. I mean, they didn't have coaches coming up to you and hitting you in the face or, or you know, roughing you up, which is what they did. So anyway, there were a lot of fights, but the guys got discouraged. I mean, we, there were 90 of us that went out there and only 36 came back. So that was a differential. So you know that, I mean, bad, good, or indifferent, what was negative about that? Well, I kept saying, they're running off some of the good players. 
because in my mind, I wasn't going to quit if they killed me because I needed a scholarship. I wanted a scholarship. I wanted to come back. Anyway, I survived. And, uh, and even one story in one of, of Coach Bryant's books, um, Coach was really, I think, Zaplak was the one who was kind of picking on me. And they were trying to make things difficult for me. And, and um, they, they told the trainer, find out if he has any injuries or anything. Let's see whether we can't get rid of him. Well, Smokey starts it on me a little bit, and I said, what the hell's going on? He said, Dennis, he says, they don't think you're a football player. And I said, tell those two guys I'll be here when they're gone. I just did it, I just came out, you know? He put that in his book because sure enough, they didn't run me off. And, uh, but for me, it was just a function of getting a scholarship. It's just making the team, that's all I wanted to do. <clears throat> so. Anyway, one of the, Bear had an obsession about this. A lot of people don't know that when he left Kentucky, he quit Kentucky thinking he had the Arkansas job on a Friday. Plans changed over the weekend. They told him he didn't have the job. So he comes to A&M sight unseen because he didn't have any other place to go. So he had an obsession just to really try to win, and, and, and he, he did it in his own way, uh, which really wasn't that bad as I look at it today. But uh, <laughs> one, one quick story, uh, Sunday comes up, and, and the guys thinking, well, maybe we can get a break on practice. Let's say we all want to go to church. So coach said, yeah, we'll take you to church after practice. <laughs> Sun up, we work out, we go to church, and he makes us sit on the first three rows. Well, the poor preacher, middle of the service, we're all out like snoring and la <laughs> loud, so loud it hardly, he could hardly <laughs> preach. But the, I thought that was kind of interesting. But uh, the fun part, well, though, was that. Uh, not, and this wasn't fun, it was, it was a positive part for me in terms of um, termination of, of the, the practice. Billy Schrader has a sunstroke, and he nearly dies on us out there on the field. So that changed the whole spoke of everything, but it didn't really change the characteristic of the way he was coaching. Uh, a lot of guys continue to quit. We had an all-conference guy by the name of Bill um, uh, uh, Broussard, Fred Broussard. All-conference, I mean, he was, he was the epitome of 225 pounds, mean, tough. But when they graded him, he would only grade about 35%. So he was only playing about every other play. You know, he, that was just his MO. And they couldn't get him to change that. And so he gets really frustrated and quits right in the middle of a Saturday afternoon practice, which we used uh, the uh, football field and rodeo field for junction, where the whole town turned out for it, you know? And he walks off the field. And Coach Bryant doesn't even let him in the camp that night, runs him out, and he has to stay at the bus station that night to catch the bus out. But everybody walked to the bus station at night, you know, they were scared to walk out during the daytime. But, you know, it was just one of those things that, that we all went through. So we come back, and we know that Coach Bryant had recruited a lot of good guys. You know, so we were confident somewhere down the road we'll, we'll have the Crows back, the Krugers. And so they introduced me to the, to the guards when, when we get the first day. And I'll go to shake hands with this one guy. He doesn't have an arm. Murray Trimble. That's it. We're recruiting one-armed guards? Gee, what's wrong with him? So I now see Crow. Crow's face is all down like this. And really bad in, in when he came, you know, because he had that for us. And I said, he's supposed to be the big running back? I said, OK. <laughs> so I go, to, I go to my room, beside the room. And they have a junior college transfer named Glenn Denning. And we're going to bed, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm watching him. 
He goes over to the laboratory and pulls out this thing. And I said, what are you doing? He said, it's my glass eye. <laughs> I said, that does it, that does it. <laughs> Look at the cripples we got. <laughs> but I got me a new roommate too, I didn't want to. But the next, the, the next the fall, we were pretty brutal, we win one game. We win one game because we found out in the film, and this is the University of Georgia, when the quarterback took the ball, his feet were even, he would pass. Now if he put this foot back, he would hand off to the right side. If he put that foot back, he'd hold to the left side. So we knew which side to line up on. And so that was, that was one game that we won. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a, but um, um, two interesting things happened that season. One, here I am, still trying to think, I gotta, I, I gotta play something, I think I can make a team. Well, the, the, all the older, the varsity guys, he was really putting it on them, and so he started letting the younger guys like myself play a little bit, okay? Which we started doing. So we get down to the SMU game, and and I had been substituting for Schrader because Schrader just couldn't go the whole length of the game and he played defensive tackle. But in the films, there the, the tackle for SMU was a guy by the name of, um, uh, what was it? I wrote it down. Well, uh, Forrest Gregg, yeah. Forrest Gregg was an All-American, weighed 230 pounds, mean as a skunk. And I said, there's no way in the world this, I mean, this guy's gonna kill me. So I made up my mind. In those days, we started learning when we fired out, we could use our elbow pretty good. So first play, I charge off sides purposely and catch him right on the jaw, knock him in the backfield, and they have to carry him off the field. And so I said, all right, I don't have to worry about him for a quarter. <laughs> but he nearly kills me the fourth quarter because he couldn't come back in. Now, after the game, I'm going to the restroom, restroom room like this, and his arm comes around me, and it's Coach Brian. He kind of pulls me over, and he said, Dennis, you charged offside purposely, didn't you? I look up, and I said, yes, sir. I said, you didn't think I could beat him fairly, do you? <laughs> That's my boy. I started every game after that for the rest of my career. So I said, all right. But one of the things they did, and I had a great rapport with Coach Ryan. I was one of the few guys that did uh, for a lot of different reasons, but uh, I had a lot of quick speed uh, for the first two feet, and that's all. But so we started doing some stunning, which is what I did in high school. And so I would, I would talk to our guard coach and say, hey, what do you think about doing this stuff? They would at least listen. So we did some things like that that year and we played Rice. And we were so successful with it that they didn't make a first down until the third quarter. So then we did a lot of little stuff like that that was new, that people didn't use. And uh, he put out spread formation so which we didn't run anyway. But he wanted the opposition who was scouting to think that's what we did. So he did, he was a smart, good coach. Now, uh, we go on to, um, to the next year. We are the, we don't know what kind of team we really have, but we know we have the Crows, the Cougars, and those talented guys. And Murray Trimble, the one-armed guy, was really the meanest guy on the team. Because he could take that stub and use it as a, as a weapon. And he bloodied more noses than anybody I'd take. Like, bam, bam. He, could, he could work you over. And so, anyway, that was, that was a good year in 55. And what really topped it off, uh, the top of the season, we played TCU. TCU was supposed to win the conference. And we really beat them. So from that point on, we, we won, we, we lost the conference by a half a game. Otherwise we would have won the conference. 
Now, what happened was, because of all this good recruiting, so to speak, one-eyed guys, no arms, busted up face, we get on probation. So, you know, we don't have a chance to go to the bowl. We go, and then the season's over with, and everybody goes to their summer jobs, and guess who requests me to come back to Sheffield Steel? Those guys in the blast furnace. I had really made friends with all of them. <laughs> they followed the game, and then one of the guys was from Fredericksburg, good German guy, and he kind of palled up with me, and uh, we, uh, I got to be real good friends, so I, I spent the summer again in the blast furnace. Now, plus I was able to get into the other parts of the mill, which I really wanted to do anyway. So, 56 was a good year. We won the Southwest Conference Championship. We are number three in the nation. And we were a good football team. Now, the fifth year, or Coach Bryant's fourth year, um, I'm still working on my, I had two degrees, geology and business. And I did some graduate work in uh, geology. And so I had an opportunity to be a student coach. Got my scholarship. And um, we, um, we worked through the season, doing good. We get down to the Rice game, and guess what? He announces that he's going to Alabama. We're number one in the nation then. And it just, you know, defeats the whole taking balloon, just popped it for us, and, uh, and we lo lose the last two games. Now, that said, Coach Ryan's going to Alabama, and um, so he had offered uh, Drake Keith, Gene Stallings, myself, and Dee Powell a job to come to Alabama. Now, I'm having to go in the Air Force to pilot training, and that my, my due date was like 10 months down the road. Great opportunity. I just didn't want to be a coach, and I told Coach Ryan that. And, uh, I had taken statistics that year, and I, I made the mistake of telling Coach, I said, well, you know, I don't like the, the, the stats in football. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, on any given Saturday, 50% of the coaches lose 100% of the time. He said, not me, old buddy. And of course, that was the case with him. But anyway, Herb Thompson, you all know Herb Thompson? Herb Thompson uh, was my salesman teacher in, uh, at, at school. And I, he secured the only job in the School of Business with Procter & Gamble. So I told Coach, I said, I want to get in the business where I don't, I don't want to coach ever anyway. So I'm going to take this opportunity. He said, okay, fine. So I go to New York thinking I'm going to get in this fancy advertising place. You know, I get up there and then uh, I meet one guy. And I said, where's the office? Where, where's the training room? <laughs> Dennis, there's not one. I said, what are we going to do? He said, we're coming out with Jeff Peanut Butter, and you're going to sell Jeff Peanut Butter to all the stores that we can't sell to. I said, are you kidding me? He said, no. That was my training program. <laughs> and I said, my kingdom. I went into every store for, for, for two weeks and never got a jar on the shelf. <laughs> so. And they, they, some of those people were pretty rude. <laughs> so I said, I walk in one day with my suit on, a camera, a little briefcase in, and I don't say anything to the guy, you know. So, and finally he, he gets real nervous. He comes over, he says, can I help you, sir? I said, yes, sir. He said, what can I do for you? I said, I'm with the Internal Revenue. I'm here to look at your books. <laughs> the guy nearly faints on me, you know. So we, <laughs> We get by, we go over to his little counter, and I finally said, "Look, I haven't sold a jar of peanut butter." I told him my whole story, and I said I had to do something. I was just frustrated. He said, "Give me six jars." <laughs> so anyway, it, that was the training program. They wanted to see if you could stay in there, and and and, that, and, and I found out that later. Well, I passed all that, which was good, and then they sent me to uh, New Orleans. San Francisco, Salt Lake City. So I finished my tour. 
Went in the Air Force, got my pilot's license, flew B-47s, got out, okay? So I'm thinking that I can get a job with, a, with commercially, or I can go back to Procter & Gamble. And I had the good fortune to run into Phil Good, and, I, and Phil said, what are you doing now? And I told him. I said, I'm trying to figure out what, what direction I'm going to go. And he said, well, we're starting this little savings and loan. Would you be interested in coming with us? I said, yes, sir. And so I do. Mainly, and the salary is only 5000 The offer for, I did get an offer from, from Delta for 15000 Big difference. But I transferred into reserves to fly it, so I was making a little money there. But I knew, I knew what I wanted was to be in a small town again, and but more importantly, to be back at AM. I did not want to live in a big city. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a taxi cab driver for, for 10 to 15 years because I'd get bored. So I said, I did. Best decision I ever made. I guarantee you I had more fun at the savings and loan and, and, and with Herschel, and I learned a lot from Herschel, believe me. Because one of the things that was happening with College Station is beginning to grow. In fact, in 1960, we only had 11,396 uh, people at College Station. And the university only had 7,000. But everybody, Olive, we knew we were going to grow. We were going to get females. And Rudder said it was going to happen. And I knew that's where we can grow. And plus the fact, if we were going to grow, we had to have somebody that would loan money on houses. We did well, super well. In fact, I've become the executive vice president and we're up to about 15 million. And the growth then in 1966, let's see, we were, were up to about 13. We needed a bank. We needed a bank that would get out there and service to people, and, and uh, so I had the opportunity, thank you, Lord, to be able to start Bank of A&M. So I concentrated on, on students, faculty, and so forth, put deans on my, my board, Frank Hubert, Fred, Fred Meyer, from those guys that y'all remember, see, and we did well. In fact, I probably was on more interviews with prospective professors than anybody, other than the people hiring, because we had to sell them on College Station. That wasn't the prettiest job here, you know? It was not, it was not something everybody, was, particularly from California or any of these big schools, to say, oh, oh, what a neat place. Well, it really wasn't. <laughs> But we sold them, and uh, long story short, and, and, and the students. I said, okay, I'm working with the students. Students started banking with me. That was the beginning of the Vietnam War. We didn't have credit cards in those days. So every graduating senior that went into the military, I gave him a blank check for a line of credit for $1,000. Uh, and they could, and then the feds would send their, their checks to me. So they could bank wherever they want. Because one of the things I learned moving around, if I didn't have a bank that I could, so it worked. So we did real well there. Now, what happens then, in 71, Dick Hervey becomes the mayor. And we started a strategic plan of growth. We wanted to really capitalize on home, homes, new homes, new people, shopping centers, entertainment, and all the things that a city needed. Grocery stores, we didn't have grocery stores and medical, we had schnitz at College Station. So that then required some innovative process in terms of how do we fund all this. So one of the things that I put together, took Bill Fitch as the developer, and I said pick six contractors, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to work as a team. I had had enough confidence with uh, my correspondent bank, Bank Southwest. By the way, the, the guy that headed up that was the next football player, Dooley Dawson. And uh, 
he agreed to buy loans from us because we didn't have the deposit base to make all those loans. I was running 80% loaned up as it was, and that was against the rules. And uh, so, make long story short, uh, we did that, and then I got to see how complex it was. So I hired the chief loan analyst in Dallas out of Mercantile. He was an Aggie. So he helps me, he's a lot smarter than me, to structure the loans, piece them together, so that we could take a whole section, okay, piece it together, and borrow a million dollars on it, and then work it down. That worked great. Then, the best part of what happened, this is why I get so excited about College Station. North Bardell comes in as city manager. And he'd been working there, and we'd been talking a lot about the problems that you have in developing these tracks. And I said, North, you know, take Southwood Valley there for Southwood Valley Road. We know we're going that way south, right? Yeah. We know we're going to have to have water and serve utilities out here, right? Yeah. Why don't you oversize? In other words, if it took just a 12 inch line, make it a 24. Sir, the same way. And I said, the other thing I want to do is take those cotton picking electric lines, put them underground. So we went underground with everything. So our, our subdivisions, wide streets, all of that, upscale housing, really began to take off. But we then had the capital then to take care of that, which really helped. Because from 1970, from five million to 1980, my bank grew to $80 million. Now, we then really started developing uh, the system. And so, how much time do I really have? Okay. So, you know, this is when the fun part gets here. All of a sudden, we're a little bit of competition for the city of Bryan. So <laughs> he had a few problems to solve there. And, uh, and again, my old philosophy, taking a negative, making a positive out of it. So we had a problem with electrical. We just couldn't get the agree on the renewing of the contract. They wanted more money than we wanted to give them. And they were still hiring anybody else. And we all get together and, and um, well, let's go somewhere else. So we go to Gulf State Utility and I actually buy our electrical cheaper. Solve that problem. Well, then we had the same problem with water. So we, <laughs> we bought water from the university for three years before we, because there's no potable water in College Station. It's all in the well fields west of town. Then the other problem that the College Station had, we didn't have the bonding capacity to handle all this stuff. So we got an oil company to go out there, drill all that up. We bought the water back like we would oil and gave them, a, in those days, 70% investment tax credit. And 10 years, got all the capital back and they made money. So that's how we solved that problem. But it's those little problems that, that all of a sudden, everybody thought it was a negative. I said, gee whiz. And uh, I can remember Halter saying to me, he said, Dennis, you're the only guy that can see further than me. And I said, why? Here was the story about Halter. Halter was being recruited to A&M. He's up in Washington. And, and you know, I've been sending him the Eagle and I've been talking about banking with me and so forth and so on. So we, uh, he calls me the day before he leaves and he says, my car crashed. I said, well, just buy a new one. He said, well, how can I do that? Go down to a dealer. Tell him what you want. Let me talk to the dealer. We'll get him to send me the draft. I'll pay for it. You drive the new car down here. He says, what about the insurance? I said, I'll put the insurance on you. I mean, we can do that. That's no big deal. He says, what happens if I get killed? I said, well, I'll put some life insurance on you too. <laughs> then when you get down here, sign it. So that's the way we did it. But it, it's, you know, it's, I did a lot of stuff like that, that the bankers 
department really kind of fussed at me about, but you know, it was a mission statement. You had to accomplish the mission statement. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, so, um, as, as a bank, you know, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the bank now. When I start the bank, there's not a lot of capital money here, you know, it's, it's, you, so I had to do everything in the world to try to get people to the bank with me. And uh, one of the guys I call is Coach Bright. He said, Coach, I need a big favor. And he says, what? I said, I've got this bank going. I want you to be a stockholder, and I want you to buy some stock. And it was just pause. I had made up my mind. We were selling the stock in 200 share lots. He said, well, how many shares do you want me to buy? I said, Coach, 200. Real long pause. And he grumbled, grumbled, and said a curse word. And he said, I have more confidence in you than that. Give me 1,000 shares. <laughs> I said, all oh, right, yes, sir. I did. Now, the sequel to that story, when he dies in 1983, his son, in his will, leaves a $100,000 endowment scholarship to all the sons and daughters who played for him at A&M. Mm. We have 37 kids that have gone through that program now. So, I mean, there was, he had a big heart. And the one thing that, that I was able to do is, I got along with him, I think mainly because, I, I mean, he did something to me one day I thought he was gonna kick me off the team for. I come, he's coming out of the dressing room, I run right into him, and this is like my sophomore year anyway. And he said, when are you gonna really get tough? He tears my shirt off my like shirt. Cause he, he, he would do that to you. And I said, I grabbed his and I said, right now, tore it off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but <laughs> the, the, the thing, he, I always had a good, good take with him and uh, he, he would even listen to me on, uh, on designing little football plays. I gotta tell you one quick story then, another football play. We're playing Baylor my senior year. They're the toughest team in the league. They have Bill Glass, All-American, everything. His tackle was all conference, his center was all conference. And I was playing the nose guard slot. And I tell Coach Bryant and my guard coach, I said, there is no way, those guys are gonna kill me. I don't have any, I said, why don't we use a different approach? And they said, well, they kind of hung their head and said, all right, what kind of idea do you have? I said, let me do this. In those days, you, you could grab the nose guard, you know, <laughs> hang on to him, do different. I would play like I'm charging the center, which was my slot. Then I would charge all the way across, grab Bill Glass by the nose guard. That's all. I wouldn't try to tackle him or anything. I'd grab him and put him down. And I had Part E behind me then, make it the tackles. Or I'd go all the way over to the, to the I did that up and down the line until, until um, we won. They had to carry me off the field. I was so beat up. <laughs> I mean, it was those guys. But, I mean, he listened to me. That was, that, that was my point. So, anyway, uh, the, um, the bank continues to, to grow. And um, I have one more good banking story because it's really, really re related to a neat thing that happened to AM. In, in all of us. One of the guys I go talk to about stock, excuse me, I have to get a little, is a guy by the name Bum Bright. Bum was one of those guys that liked football players anyway. So I go in there and I said, Bum, here's my deal. And uh, he listened to it and he says, Dennis, he says, I don't need to buy any stock in your bank. He was the largest stockholder in, um, in uh, Republic Bank, he owned banks. I mean, I couldn't believe how wealthy he was. And I said, well, Coach, I don't, I mean, Mr. Bright, I, 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 I'm okay with that. I, all right, but I just thought you'd want to help me. He said, here's what I'll do. I'll put $200,000 in non-interest bearing CDs in your bank as deposits, because that's what you need. And I said, yes, sir, which he did. 
But he said, there's one caveat to that. Every 90 days, there's some period of time, I want you to bring your financials to me, and I want you to be my eyes and ears at Texas A&M, tell me everything that's going on, so forth and so on. Well, which I did. But it was like going to a graduate school. I mean, I learned more stuff from him, what the big banks were doing, how they were operating, the whole works. So, we come to 1978. And he said, okay, Dennis, play like, don't get any ideas, play like, you're on the Board of Regents. And you had one passion that you would like to see accomplished. I said, okay, I can tell you that right now. I think university should have a research part. We got all these people consulting all over the country, and we're losing that technology, and we're not letting them patent work or do anything. Stanford's doing it. Uh, the Golden Triangle, the Carolinas are doing it. We're not. Okay. Now, never talked about it again. Now, the next stage, I'm seeing where the college station is continuing to grow and we really need a bigger bank. Plus the fact I had, for 15 years then, no, 13 years, I had asked people to be my stockholder, never paid a dividend, and I wanted to make sure they got some money. So I thought it was a good time to sell, capitalize out, and uh, be a part of a big bank. Well, the only mistake I made was I didn't found out I didn't like being a part of a big bank. <laughs> but we got all my stockholders, got their money, and made money, okay? Then I went to work for, for, the, for the city. And again, the timing was right. Everything was rolling. Uh, we, we, you know, we were having problems with, like Rain Tree, for example. They didn't want, um, they didn't want this to be developed for Westinghouse. There was, there was an anti-commercial sector going on, but we were fortunate enough to bring in the mall and some other stuff. But during this process, we then said, okay, let's go south if nobody wants us in town. And that was the concept for Pebble Creek because I knew we'd get uh, retirees, which we got in, in droves, okay? So there was a little article in Texas Monthly that said, um, um, College Station is putting Pebble Creek together and along with a research park, okay? Which we had in the plans. So I get a call from Bum. Bum says, tell me what you're doing. I said, same thing I told you in 78. He said, tell me again. I did. 30 days later, he calls me and he says, I want you to put a presentation to the Board of Regents and tell us, by then he's on the board, by the way, in 79, <laughs> uh, and he's chairman then. I said, I will do that. So I make the presentation. Ding, ding, ding. Boy, I'm so happy. I'm just saying all the reasons why we need to do this, 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 and that. And spent an hour and a half. It was really neat. Me meeting's over. 45 days later, he calls me up and he says, Dennis, I said, I got good news, I got bad news. I said, well, give me the good news first. We like the concept of a research park. What could be bad? He says, we want it on campus. Go to the council, see what you can do, which I did. That was the genesis for the research park. So my point in all of this, in, in, in so many different little stories, I had, a, just a great opportunity to be on the team. Just a little pulling guard to just carry bags of money around, make sure they got it in the right place, and we build out College Station to where it is today. And if you look at the population, we grew 20,000 people from 1970 to 1980. Tremendous growth. Get the mall in. The mall gets put in in April of 82. And I, I have a little deal here, but I can tell you just by memory that it was, it was 
a factor in doubling our, all of our sales tax. Sales tax in 1979 was about, two, about 100,000 bucks. And by the end of 1980, it had gotten up to 400. I'm sorry, yeah, my, 1980. From 1980 to 1990, it goes from that to 8 million in one year, I mean 10 years. So that was the kind of dynamic growth we had and that we're seeing today in our, in our population is like 97,000. And now, I'm saying all this and I could tell you a lot of stories, but you no know, time's a factor. And, and I have a tendency to be Gabby, but to me, being at the right place at the right time and having the ability to implement was the best thing that ever happened to me. I have a couple of things that I believe in very strong. Success breeds success. Two, negatives always have a positive. And I always found that if there was a negative, and I've had a lot of negatives in my life, but if I've worked at it long enough, I'm trying to way to make it positive, which we have done on numerous occasions here at the city. So from that standpoint, I am, I am just absolutely delighted to have um, been here in College Station, participated in that, and I'm going to do it a couple more years. I'm 78. So I feel like I still have enough energy and everything left in me to go. Now, let me give you a little bit of history as it relates to the 34, 36 Junction boys that came back. Nine were engineers, six were petroleum engineers, two civil and one geology. 11 educators, by the way, six of those guys went to coach on, at, at Alabama. And uh, another story about the game last year too. Three division one coaches, one dean, uh, one superintendent of schools, two ranchers, four architects, two attorneys, uh, bank presidents, me, a mayor, and a veterinarian, Charlie Hall, who's in uh, So all, I mean, and you go back to look at the other teams, maybe four or five guys maybe do well. Now, who are the two guys who really did well? Billy Pete Huddleston. Billy Pete Huddleston was captain of the football team uh, his, junior year, uh, his senior year, my junior year. The four of us roomed together, Granbury, Hale, and, and Billy Pete and I, all studying petroleum engineering and geology. I knew Billy Pete was going to do something. Today, he is, has made an unbelievable fortune. The numbers will stagger you if I told you. Now, guess what else he has done that will really blow your mind? At um, Princeton, they hired him 29 years ago to manage their fossil fuels. It was less, it was less than 100 million. I asked him the other day where it was. He says, I got it to eight billion. And they love him. He also, he also taught petroleum engineering for 18 years at A&M at and has endowed over 100 scholarships. Now, when we got in trouble with, um, with traditions, I asked him to help us out. So he picked up the note and bought the whole thing out of Traditions Golf Course, which we have out there today. Yes, ma'am. I know you want to ask something. I, you, I see your lips quivering. Uh, just, uh, just, just remember, I've heard some of these stories you've told me before, Daniel. So it's just great to hear them again. Oh, really? Okay. Yes, sir. Here's one I haven't told you about, but what I really have enjoyed, one of the passions that I've had was try to get the two cities to work together. And, and a negative popped up at the med school. Dr. Dickey, Dickey wanted to have her med school on campus, really wanted 150 acres. She's part of the system, university, no, they didn't want to do it. I said, 
Nancy, here's my story. Let me give you 200 acres next to traditions. 50 acres has to be public, private, which we can do an ROI of for the city for taxes and all that stuff. Plus, I see what we've done on, on the research part. That 50 acres can be your endowment, and I promise you in 25 years it'll be worth $100 million. She liked it. We, so we put it together. Then, guess what happens? We, she is now generating $300,000 a year from, the, from one of the buildings that's privately owned and financed, and then the pharmaceutical building that's out there now. Now, out of all that, what has happened, I really believe that we will be the pharmaceutical center of the Southwest, or maybe the nation, in the next 25 years. We have every pharmaceutical plant in the country looking at us. We got uh, Glockson, Smith, and Klein starting this fall on a 100,000 square foot building on pandemic medicine. And uh, that is gonna breed off into other things. And then we will have another opportunity to have an economic e uh, ledger for the university and for the city in a new product, pharmaceuticals. Because they're, they're having problems in New Jersey, California is like this, and everybody's looking for ways to, to generate some revenue, one. Number two, the thing that made the difference is that we developed the a way to generate vaccine through, um, through tobacco plants. Did you know before vaccines were generated in fertile chicken eggs? So we found a way to do that. Secondly, we found a way to build a clean rooms, 30, uh, 20 by 40, where we don't have to build expensive facilities. That's gonna help. So that's a new uh, Aggie division of finding a way to multiply uh, a number. Okay.